My name is Marianne de Beur. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bergen. Um, and as moderator, I will guide you through the day. Uh, and together, we'll explore the relationship between art, activism, and feminism, uh, both in the Middle Eastern context and in Scandinavia. We'll look at different perspectives and different um, art and aesthetic expressions. So, throughout the day, we will uh, listen to uh, a number of invited speakers. Um, but for, before we start uh, and give the word to them, I would like to uh, give an introduction and try to introduce some concepts and di disentangle maybe some concepts that are relevant for this symposium. Uh, now, I'd like to start with feminism. Uh, and one of the main misconceptions about feminism is that it is mainly a Western concept and idea. Um, so for many it never may come as a surprise that feminism actually has roots, long roots in the Middle East um, and the first feminist initiatives uh, can be found uh, in the Middle East uh, during the late 1800s. Um, so this was a period in which discussions on feminist ideas gave public attention and the first feminist movements emerged in the region. So now we're looking at countries like Egypt and Iraq uh, and Lebanon uh, and Iran uh, in particular. Uh, and Huda Sharavi, that is depicted here, uh, she is a pioneer uh, in the fem feminist movement in the Middle East. Uh, and she established the first uh, feminist movement, the Egyptian Feminist Union, in 1923. Uh, and by looking at feminism historically, um, from a Middle Eastern perspective, we can also find a lot of international links uh, between um, the Western and the Middle Eastern context. Uh, and it's interesting to see that the movements in Egypt and Iran and Iraq had close links to the suffragette uh, movements in, in Britain and in France. Uh, so that, uh, they joined in a mutual fight for obtaining uh, the right to vote. Um, and since then, uh, a whole range of different uh, feminist movements have emerged in the Middle East region. Um, and as we know, uh, by gaining political rights, by gaining the right to vote, once women have ex established that as a field, uh, it tends to be more easy to demand even more rights. So this is something that um, uh, Anne Phillips, uh, a feminist philosopher, uh, philosopher has uh, described as the politics of presence. So once you are present in the uh, political field, then even more rights will be, uh, uh, will be demanded. So, uh, both within a, uh, a Middle Eastern and a Western con uh, context, feminism is a highly contentious uh, uh, topic and, and concept. Um, and I've been doing research in Iran, and in the Iranian context, feminism tends to be associated with something that is uh, anti-Islam, that is anti-religious, secular, uh, pro-women only, elitist, uh, and it's also often associated with something that uh, in Iran is called Kharb Sadigi, something that uh, is uh, associated with the West. Um, but, uh, uh, and so, for, for this reason, many uh, refrain from identifying uh, as a feminist for more pragma pragmatic reasons. Uh, but if we look in the Scandinavian context, this is not uh, strange uh, uh, for us either. I mean, uh, in Scandinavia, there are several uh, examples of uh, feminism being labeled uh, an elitist feminine phenomenon. Uh, something that is uh, only relevant for uh, the leftist uh, uh, or uh, as a, a radical idea. Uh, and quite recently, the, uh, the Minister of um, Integration and Immigration in Norway, Sylvie Listerhev, has been one of the proponents of this idea, saying that she sees no, so no reason to label her, herself a feminist uh, because it's uh, associated with leftist politics are not uh, applicable for her as a right-wing politician. And actual, actually similar uh, 
several con conceptions of feminism had have been uh, uh, raised by uh, by the Danish Minister of uh, of Immigration as well, saying that uh, feminism uh, is only for the elite and not uh, uh, not uh, for for the grassroots movement. So here we can see uh, why there is a need to move beyond the strict dichotomy dichotomy between a Western and a Middle Eastern feminism and rather go um, uh, a bit further and look at the variations and the breadth that can be found uh, on the feminist scene uh, uh, in these two contexts. Now, feminist activism is a transnational phenom phenomenon and it takes many forms. Uh, and as I said, I've done research in Iran uh, and here um, a main struggle has been to fight uh, uh, the idea that women are second-class citizens. So that women uh, lack uh, a number of legal rights and, uh, in terms of divorce and marriage, for instance, uh, and that they face uh, systematic discrimination in many regards. So um, the fight has been about uh, gaining rights in terms of marriage and divorce and so forth, but also uh, to have the right to pass their nationality onto the children, that it's not only through uh, the father that the nationality sh uh, uh, should follow. Um, and also uh, to fight the guardian system that is, um, uh, that is widespread in Iran. For instance, um, if a woman wants to travel abroad, to leave Iran, uh, she needs to have the permit of her husband uh, uh, before she can leave the country. Uh, and even uh, a female pr professor that I know, uh, a renowned professor in Iran, she was invited to give a keynote lecture at the University of Germany, and even her, she had to prove uh, that her husband would allow her to travel abroad. So this is a, a real problem uh, that uh, many feminists uh, uh, in Iran and outside Iran are, are trying to, uh, to, or they are addressing. Uh, and another issue has been, uh, from what we can see at this photo, that many women uh, demand uh, to have access to uh, Iran's sports arenas. Um, and uh, many of the Iranian, um, or in the Iranian um, sports stadiums, uh, they're only allowed for uh, men, so women can, uh, cannot access. So this has been one fight that's been going on. And another one has been the Stop Stoning campaign. Uh, it started in 2006 after the news uh, that uh, a couple that was convicted of adultery had been stoned to death in Mashhad. Uh, Magube and Abbas, uh, they had been um, uh, convicted for adultery. Um, and uh, in uh, Article 83 in the Iranian Penal Code, it says that the penalty for uh, adultery is, uh, uh, is stoning. So, um, uh, the initiators behind the campaign started to collect signatures to, um, uh, to protest uh, this kind of punishment and also to raise international awareness that this is actually going on uh, and also that there has been a rise in uh, these kinds of punishments. Um, another important aspect that this campaign has addressed is that um, uh, stoning is a highly gendered and uh, uh, gendered punishment that often um, uh, is something that women face due to their lack of legal rights in terms of marriage and divorce. It's often uh, women who are, are more um, um, uh, convicted of uh, these sorts of uh, uh, crimes. Um, <clears throat> but these problems of uh, uh, kind of gender-based violence in general are not limited to one or to the Middle East or to one region or to one culture or to one religion. Uh, gender-based violence is not only a problem within uh, the Middle East but widespread uh, uh, in Scandinavian societies as well. Uh, through honor crimes, rape, uh, sexual abuse and sexual assault. Um, these are crimes that are closely related to gender and sexuality. Uh, so although women in particular are uh, targeted by this kind of violence, 
there is also raised awareness that uh, gender and sexual minorities are also uh, targeted by, uh, by these crimes. Uh, and increasingly, and this uh, I find is very interesting, uh, the feminist uh, struggle uh, in the Middle East uh, is also uh, moving toward including um, uh, gender and sexual minorities into their struggles and addressing the um, uh, LGBTQ issues. Um, for instance, uh, Amina Modud, who is one of, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, one of the most uh, known Islamic feminists, she has this gender jihad that is going on, that is uh, a struggle to fight uh, uh, gender discrimination that are being done uh, in the name of Islam. Uh, even her, she has uh, incorporated uh, the LGBTQ issues into her um, uh, into her campaign. Um, so, um, uh, so this is an interesting uh, turn to see. Now, in recent years, uh, there has been a link between feminism and activist, activism in many uh, political events uh, in the Middle East region. Uh, and after the presidential election in Iran in 2009, uh, hordes of people took to the streets to protest that uh, uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was re-elected for the second time, uh, and they demanded that their votes be recounted. So um, the protest uh, resulted in the so-called Green Movement. That was a, a big um, uh, movement of. Uh, people demanding their uh, uh, democratic rights. Um, and it, it was interesting to see that not only did women and men protest side by side, but uh, a coalition of women was formed and was high, very active uh, in the aftermath of these uh, demonstrations. So here we can see that the feminism and the uh, political activism is uh, closely linked. Uh, and two years later, um, uh, the uprising started uh, that we know of as uh, uh, the Arab Revolution or the Arab Spring, it's sometimes referred to. Uh, it started in Tunisia and spread to countries like Libya, Egypt, Yemen, Syria and Bahrain. Uh, and there were also protests in countries like Morocco and Lebanon uh, and uh, Algeria, Iraq. Uh, even Saudi Arabia had some protests, although they were soon silenced. Um, and we have also seen uh, the last years that in, uh, uh, that in, um, uh, uh, in Turkey there have been uh, uh, violations of, uh, of human rights and, uh, and these, uh, there are also protests emerg emerging here uh, as well. So uh, through these events uh, we see that they have been permitted by um, the struggles related to women's rights and to feminism to gender politics and to gender-based violence. Uh, so the aftermath of this, these events have entailed a rise in authoritarianism um, and uh, civil wars and massive refugee crises. But we also see that uh, uh, the gender uh, aspect in these uh, events are, um, uh, are striking. So um, the influence of gender to these events should not be seen as scattered episodes. And Naj Alali, who is professor uh, at SOAS at the University of London, she argues that gender and women are not mar marginal to these kind of revolutionary and counter-revolutionary processes and developments, but she claims that through women and gender issues, it's possible to recognize what kind of big issues at, is at stake in state politics. Uh, and. Um, uh, so although it's often marginalized, women and gender issues are key factors for understanding how hierarchies, inequalities and power relations are constructed and normalized, particularly in periods of change. So um, this helps explain why there was a drama dramatic increase in the reports on harassment and sexual assault of women during these um, events and uh, sexual and gender minorities during uh, and in the aftermath of, uh, of the uprisings. Um, and it's also interesting to see that uh, although there are so many political scientists and political analysts who have been working on the Middle East region, 
I, I don't think anyone predicted these events. I don't think anyone predicted these uprisings. And what is interesting to see now after um, uh, 2011 and all these changes have, have taken place is that people are starting to look for different sources and for different methods and not only rely on political analysis anymore but starting to explore uh, other kinds of, uh, of sources. And I think it is in this regard that art and uh, aesthetic expressions like film, poetry, music, theatre, uh, street art, graffiti, all kinds of uh, aesthetic expressions uh, are really um, um, uh, can enable uh, a lens for us to understand and to uh, access the diversities and pluralities in this field in more and, uh, new and more nuanced ways. So, uh, what I hope uh, for today is that the work and uh, aesthetic expressions of the invited artists uh, will have the potential for challenging some of the established notions and norms uh, that, ten that tend to frame our thinking of uh, of the Middle East, uh, of the Middle East as exclusively Muslim and Arab, uh, the Middle Eastern woman as uh, uh, silenced, silenced and uh, oppressed, the Mi Middle Eastern man as an oppressor, uh, and Mid Middle Eastern gender roles as fixed and patriarchal. Uh, and not only to think about the Middle East as a zone of war and of oppression, but as a site for everyday life. So this is something that I hope that we will uh, explore throughout the day. Uh, so I think I will leave it with, uh, at that. Thank you very much. Okay, so I would like to introduce uh, the first uh, speaker we have today, uh, Nefisa Oskar Lorentzen. Um, Nefisa is, is a Turkish-Norwegian author, filmmaker and journalist. Uh, she's resident in Oslo. Uh, she has a, a BA in political science from Bosporus University in Istanbul and her MA uh, in media and communication from the University of Oslo. Um, over the past two decades, decades, she has produced and directed several controversial documentaries related to Islam, uh, and her most recent film is entitled A Balloon to Allah. Um, she's also dedicated to the uh, LGBTQ uh, and human rights activism. Uh, and she has also authored quite a few books. So, I'm looking forward to, to hearing more from, from Nathisa. Uh, 